uh, land of 140 character revenues. And um, Mark was a intern here in 2008 with the with our online department, working close with graphics as well, or in the same area as graphics. And uh, he's gone on to do some really amazing things with. Uh, founding a blog called uh, 10,000 Words, which is, which is still going strong and very good, um, as well as writing a book that I can't remember the title of, but it's something like, if you want to know how to present things online, read this book. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. <laughs> um, and then he also was the social media editor of the Washington Post before taking over or moving over to Twitter in uh, July. So I'll let uh, Mark take it from here. Thank you, Mark. Sure. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I feel so important. <laughs> All right. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, so I am the manager of journalism and news at Twitter, uh, focusing specifically on how journalists can use the Twitter platform. Um, if you're not using it, um, helping you get on the platform. If you're thinking about creative ideas, um, all I do all day, well, most of what I do all day is absorb the great ideas that journalists are using Twitter for, either for sourcing or engagement or uh, promoting stories. Um, and so if you have that sort of thing where you need that sort of help either within your newsroom, within your section, or even just for uh, personal or professional reasons, we have a whole team of people uh, standing by. Um, so what I've got here is uh, Twitter for News, uh, 10 Tips for Better Engagement. What this is is um, basically uh, how you can use Twitter better, but also the things, the tools that we've made available uh, that I think you um, and journalists uh, should be taking advantage of. Um, so if you have questions in the middle of this, there are a lot of different points here, so just shoot up your hand. I'll be happy to answer uh, any question. And if you have a more general question, consider it towards the end, um, and I can uh, address it then. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about engagement. You're going to hear me say that word a lot. Um, how do we define engagement? Uh, on Twitter, it's retweets, replies, clicks on links, and favorites. Uh, first, before I go on, um, how many of you guys are on Twitter? Have you used it? Have a Twitter account? Great. Awesome. Um, so you guys are familiar with this language. Um, so engagement on Twitter. Notice that I don't have, I don't have follower count on here. A lot of people put a lot of stake in follower account. Uh, follower counts, you know, how many followers you have. Um, but it's actually important that your followers are engaged, that they're actually interacting with you, because otherwise you just have a number. So when we uh, talk about engagement, retweets, replies, clicks on links and favorites, that means people are acknowledging your content. They're actually interacting with it, they're reading with it, uh, they're reading it. So um, that is much more important than a follower account. I've seen some accounts that have thousands of followers but have low engagement uh, because they are purely promotional. So uh, that goes into the next thing, which is to think about ways of being beyond sort of a promotional account. Um, and I'll give you the uh, reasons why. But first, there are many different ways to use Twitter. Um, a lot of people, when they get on Twitter, they're like, OK, you know, do I have to tweet 10 times a day? The answer is no. Um, there are many ways to use it. The most basic thing is to listen, uh, to follow the people, follow your sources, follow your fellow journalists who are saying things that you're interested in. But to really take it to the next level, um, you have to participate. Uh, it's social media. Um, it's inherently social. And if you're not taking advantage of that social part, then you're missing out on a, the wealth of uh, information on the platform. The great thing about working at the LA Times is you guys have a great platform to, uh, to create conversations, to get people talking about the stories that you're writing and um, the uh, content that you're producing, and really getting conversations going. So looking for opportunities to create conversations. Um, also amplifying, taking those voices who don't have thousands of uh, followers, who are very small community voices, uh, like you did with the Davian story, really taking you know small voices and amplifying them. And that's a great way of using, um, using Twitter. And finally, something that journalists are using Twitter a lot for is to crowdsource, uh, to get information from people, to put out a question and say, hey, has anybody heard this, um, and getting that feedback. Just in the same way you would call people up, you would do an email. Uh, Twitter is actually faster. You don't have to um, send emails to a million gajillion people. Uh, you can uh, send out a tweet. And you can filter that very quickly because uh, you have uh, everyone has a bio associated with your, their account. Which leads me to the first thing. Don't be an egg. Um, does anybody know what this egg means, signifies? Raise your hand. In the, oh, what does an egg um, mean? It's in lieu of a picture. Yes. So when you first sign up for Twitter, you get this little egg. 
Um, and um, that signifies that you are a Twitter newbie, or that you haven't quite come out of your shell. Um, why I say don't be an egg, because as a journalist, you should be communicating who you are. So you, the first step uh, to being a uh, active journalist on Twitter is to complete your Twitter bio. Uh, this is my friend from the Washington Post, Amy Kalaule. Uh, she's a great example. She's got her picture in there. I know exactly what she looks like. Uh, she's got her full name. She's got the organization that she works for. And she's also got her website in there. So if I, you know, if Emmy sends me a message, I can click on her username and I know exactly who she is. So you need to think about uh, your Twitter bio as your byline in print or on online. This is um, how you communicate with people to tell who you are. So you wouldn't print a story that didn't have your name associated with it. And it's the same way on Twitter. You shouldn't um, engage on Twitter unless you're doing it for super private reasons uh, without having your name on there. Give you a real world example. Um, one of the uh, I was talking with a reporter from the BBC, and uh, she had an egg on her account. She hadn't tweeted that much. Uh, she um, hadn't had that many followers at that point, and she uh, wanted to. She saw a great source on Twitter, and she reached out to them and said, "Hey, I'm a reporter from the BBC. I'd like to contact you about this story." And the person tweeted back at her, "I don't believe you." And the reason why they did is because she hadn't filled out her information. They were like, why do I believe that you're a reporter from BBC? You don't have any information in your Twitter account. So um, when it comes to that point, when you're going to want to reach out to that source, you want, uh, you want to engage with people, you need to make sure that you're prepared well in advance and you're not just tweeting uh, when the time comes when you really, really need it. So tweet in advance. Uh, tip number two is to tweet your beat. So we did a study uh, not too long ago about what are the things that journalists do on Twitter, specifically journalists, uh, that uh, lead to higher follower counts, higher engagement. And we came up with four things that were across the board. The study included um, journalists of all, uh, all different markets, all different locations, um, various media, and across the board, these were the four things that we came up with. Um, the uh, first one is to tweet your beat. And what do I mean by tweeting your beat? We find that the best thing that you can do for your Twitter account is to live tweet something. So whether it's a court case or it's a red carpet or it's something related to your specific beat, to live tweet it. And we find that if you uh, do short, uh, we call it burstiness, if you have burstiness, a uh, short concentrated number of tweets um, in a short time span, um, that your follower growth is 50% more than expected. So basically, by uh, live tweeting, you're going to grow your followers. 50, uh, your follower growth is going to be 50% more than expected. So how does that play into the actual news cycle? So this is Sarah Ganim, formerly of the Patriot News, uh, now at CNN, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. She live tweeted the Sandusky trial. And so she used the hashtag Sandusky trial. She sent out a lot of really great tweets. The interesting thing with her account and accounts that we see who live tweet is that everybody has like a baseline of followers that they get every day. Everyone has like five followers, 10 followers, um, whatever uh, their average follower growth is. When you live tweet something, we see um, your follower growth skyrocket. Um, so Sarah's, we saw a huge spike in the number of followers that she had while she was live tweeting. And the interesting thing is after she stopped live tweeting, her follower growth was actually much higher than it was previous to her live tweeting. So think about the things that you're communicating, things about the, think about the things that you're covering. Um, incorporate it naturally into what you're doing. You shouldn't um, you know, go off into the Twitter sphere and not write your story, because I'm sure your editor would be very upset about that. Um, but find ways of, you know, if there's an interesting tidbit. And then you can always link back to your story. You can say, you know, hey, I'm live tweeting it. We've got updates over here on the site. And really uh, sort of feeding that in. Um, the other thing is you don't have to always live tweet something that you're specifically at or that you're specifically uh, covering at that moment. Uh, this is Chris McDaniel, Chris McDaniel from St. Louis Public Radio. Uh, he is uh, covering um, a political race. And the tweet says, Spence for MO sues Nixon from Missouri, alleging defamation in campaign ads. Here's a previous story, newer one soon. So what Chris has done, and instead of saying, you know, I'm going to live tweet it as it's happening, he's saying, hey, I've got a story that we've already written about this. Here's some archival content that we have. Read this while I'm working on the story. That does two things. It catches people in the middle of the news while their minds are uh, still fresh and directing them to his story. And also when the story comes out, people are going to be looking towards Chris for news on that particular subject. So Chris has already alerted people uh, to this. 
Um, so look for opportunities to use what you already have. If you're looking at a story and you're like, oh, I wrote something not too long ago on that very subject, tweet it out. Let people know, hey, I've got this great stuff, especially graphics, interactives, videos, photos. Tweet those out and say, hey, we're going to be working on the story. Or here's what we have coming. Uh, tip number three, use Twitter handles. The second thing with, that we found in the study is that if you use Twitter handles in your, uh, in your tweets, instead of using the uh, basic name, that you're actually more likely to get more engagement on uh, Twitter. So if you were talking about the session and you say, hey, I'm going to see Mark Lucky speak, um, you're going to get less engagement than if you included the uh, Twitter handle, at Mark S. Lucky. And um, this is a Twitter handle. You guys are all familiar, the at symbol with the username. The reason why this is is it serves two purposes. The first is if you are tweeting about a source or you're tweeting about a contact or a reporter, um, they are going to get that little notice that says you have tweeted about that particular person, and it serves for engagement down the line. Second is when you include Twitter handles, people see that you're actually engaging on Twitter, that you're using it in a very native format, um, that you aren't just pushing out your stories and a, a headline and a, a link that you're actually using it uh, to interact. And the Twitter algorithm actually surfaces you more in search because it shows that you are not just a feed. So um, before I go there, any questions uh, about anything I've talked about so far? Cool. All right, so uh, what I just said um, is you can't just be a feed on Twitter. Um, a lot of journalists, a lot of uh, publishers, content desks say, OK, I'm just going to put out my own stuff, and people are going to read it. But we find that you're going, only going to get a baseline amount of traffic if you do that. But if you mix it up, if you include mentions and you include replies, including those Twitter handles, now you're actually going to see more traffic over the long term than you would by just tweeting your own stories. Uh, so the, um, the uh, statistic behind it is news organizations that tweet 20% fewer URLs and 100% more mentions grow followers 17% more than expected. So basically, you're going to grow your traffic if you uh, mix it up, if you have some non-URL tweets. Uh, this is the Wall Street Journal. Um, they, have, uh, they did a call out asking people, how do you handle politics with your colleagues? Ever wade into a Twitter crossfire? Uh, Jenna LR, at Jenna Bear on Twitter, has responded saying, uh, WJ Careers, I'm a coward. I say, hmm, when I disagree, instead of engaging in healthy debate. So they've actually responded back to her. They have included the Twitter handle and say, hey, Jenna, uh, we'd like to talk to you. So not only are they interacting on Twitter, not just putting out a question and not uh, responding, but they've actually found a source that they can use for a future story. Um, and uh, asking her to DM them, DM being the direct message, so it's not something uh, public so they can interact. Uh, but the, um, the takeaway here is you know, when people respond to you or they uh, are tweeting out your Twitter handle, whether it's a news publisher, or a session account or your individual account, take a minute to respond to them. You're going to increase the engagement. Um, you don't have to respond to every single one. Uh, you can filter them out. But um, it takes time to uh, sort of uh, use Twitter to be interactive. Uh, so the, um, the other thing that we found in the study is you can actually use Twitter to cite your sources, not just sort of calling out, responding, and mentioning people, uh, but using it as you would a, a byline or um, a, attributing a quote. So The Guardian in this top example, they uh, said, cancer, my parents, and me. Stephen Mangan talks to Eliza B. Day. So Stephen Mangan is a reporter, and Eliza B. Day is a source. Because they've included the Twitter handles, they've actually extended the life of the tweet. So I know that if I'm interested in the story, I can follow Steven, and I can get more updates on the story. Or I can follow Eliza and get more updates on the story. So just by including that little interaction, you've given longer shelf life to your story and also future stories that you may write or this uh, person may be included in. Uh, inside Breaking News on the bottom, um, they have uh, used the AP just as you would attribute a quote. They attribute the story uh, to the AP. Uh, so think, thinking of ways, if you get something from another source, a non-LA Times source, or even if it's within the newsroom, someone something that you heard from another report or another section, uh, giving them credit uh, because that's going to increase the interaction and also um, will drive followers uh, their way. So tip number four, use good hashtags. And notice that I say good here. Um, anybody using hashtags on every single word in your tweets? OK, thank God, because I was going to have to scorch you out the building. All right, so um, use good hashtags. Find out what the central subject of the hashtag is or your subject of your tweet is and make that the hashtag. We encourage you to limit it 
uh, your tweets to one or two hashtags, just so you don't dilute uh, the process. Yes, what's up? Sure, sure, absolutely. So this is a hashtag. This is um, the it's the pound symbol followed by a keyword or phrase. So during uh, this is journal chat. This is a uh, chat amongst journalists and PR professionals so that they can um, find all the tweets that are related to this particular um, to this particular chat. So it's a way of threading the conversation. So just by including this, um, I can find everybody talking about journal chat. That's why during the election, you saw hashtag election 2012. People could follow along with that. Hashtag Sandy during the hurricane. And that's just a way of uh, not only jumping in the conversation, uh, but uh, seeing what other people are saying as well. Yes. Is there a way, especially for less um, mm -hmm. popular mm -hmm. you can easily find the election, but if you're writing about something less popular or, or arcane, is there a way to find popular hashtags so that, you know, just to those people? Mm -hmm. Is there a list or a Absolutely. way to find them? Um, so uh, I usually do one of two things. I go to a Twitter search, which is twitter.com slash search, and input the uh, basic keyword that I'm looking for in the, uh, in the search box. It'll give me uh, the most popular tweets about it, and chances are um, that they have the most popular hashtags in them. If that doesn't work, what I recommend is a third-party tool called Cloudly. It's C-L-O-U-D dot L-I, Cloudly. And what it does is you put in a search term, and it'll show you all the popular hashtags, popular keywords, um, and popular accounts that are circulating around a particular uh, hashtag. So if I were to put in Romney, I'd see hashtag election. I'd see at Mitt Romney, and I'd see election Obama, that sort of thing. Other questions about hashtags? Cool. So there's actually some statistical reasons why you should be using hashtags. Um, the study showed that hashtags can increase engagement almost 100% for journalists and 50% for news organizations. So just by including a hashtag, you're actually broadening the audience of people who will see that particular tweet. Because the way that Twitter works, only your Twitter followers are getting your feed of tweets. But say I'm, inter I'm interested in the election, I want to see other people who are talking about it. I could click on the election hashtag and find people who are talking about it. That leads me to follow other people to interact with other people. So look for opportunities to include hashtags in your tweets. Um, even if it's something simple, figure out what the keyword of your uh, tweet is and uh, throw a hashtag, um, the pound symbol, in front of it. And chances are you're going to get much more engagement around your tweets and your account than you would by not tweeting any hashtags at all. Uh, so this is an example, uh, the, the previous example from the Wall Street Journal. They used how, hashtag politics at work. And what they're able to do is to find all the people who responded to this particular call out um, because they told people to include the hashtag politics, politics at work. So instead of trying to sort through your mentions and find all the people who responded to you, you can actually just click on the hashtag and find everybody who's included it in here. Uh, notice that the hashtag is something that's not obvious. Um, hashtag politics, there's probably a large conversation already going on around that. But they've created a very niche hashtag so they could create a conversation specifically around that. Yeah. Do they always go at the end? What'd you say? Do they always go at the end? No, they uh, don't have to go at the end. That's sort of been the tradition, but the best sort of most savvy tweeters actually incorporate them into their tweets. So if you're just talking about a particular subject, I'd say, you know, um, hurricane hashtag Sandy has affected lots of people or going to vote in the hashtag election to see what happens. So you can incorporate them nat naturally. But if you're doing a call out in this way, um, it's better to be very direct with people to tell them exactly what you want from them. Uh, so they have asked the question and said, tell us with hashtag politics at work. Um, and it's much easier for people to find it. Yes. What, what, what about when there's a new subject or breaking news mm -hmm. going on and you want to start with hashtag? Yeah. Is there uh, some convention with mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. or? So um, if you are going to, if, if their hashtag doesn't exist, Create your own, um, and usually keep it very, very simple. Uh, so if it's uh, you know a person, place, or thing, you use that person, place, or thing. Together, right? Yes, exactly. No spaces in between it. Together. Yeah, um, and uh, yes, keep the hashtag all together. Keep it really short because remember you only have 140 characters, um, and you don't want to limit people's conversations by using a really, really long hashtag. Um, so look for opportunities to do that. Um, the uh, tip number five, create and search lists. I think this is one of the most underutilized tools amongst journalists is lists. 
Um, lists are a great way to categorize um, people who aren't um, necessarily in your home timeline. So for example, if I were writing a politics reporter writing about a number of different states, I could group Twitter users by those particular states to see what are people in these areas talking about. And this is also helpful if you um, want to keep up with some, something somebody is tweeting about, but you don't necessarily want them in your home timeline. You don't want them in the mix of your regular tweets. This is a great way to keep it separate. Uh, so the example here is from CNN. They've created a number of lists, anchors and reporters, CNN International, CNN News, and they've grouped their uh, CNN users uh, or reporters in that way. So if I were interested in following just the anchors and reporters, I could subscribe to this list because it's public. You can also do private lists. Maybe you just want to keep it to yourself, use it for your own reporting. Uh, you can do that as well. Um, and everybody has lists enabled. You can click on the left-hand side uh, to see uh, the list that you've created. created. Um, and I'll show you um, what a list looks like. So it looks basically just like your home timeline. Um, and it also looks the same uh, on the mobile app. Uh, these are tweets from Sanjay Gupta, Nancy Gray, CNN, uh, anchors and reporters. One of the even more underutilized functions of lists that I think journalists can really take advantage of is uh, using it to find other sources on Twitter. Um, so if you, you get two options on lists. You get subscribed to and member of. Subscribe to is the list that you've created or that you subscribe to. And member of is the list that people have added you to. So um, for example, if you were to go to my profile and you clicked on member of, you would see uh, people have added me into social media lists, technology lists, uh, New York lists, things that um, various interest groups. And it's also a great way to see how people see you on Twitter. But um, how would I use this in a reporting, uh, in the scope of reporting? So I was during the election trying to find all the members of Senate, um, um, the Senate on Twitter. And I didn't want to create my own list from scratch. I was like, somebody has to have created this list. Uh, so I went to a senator, um, to one senator, uh, clicked on member of, and of course, all the lists that they were on were you know, not only the Senate list, but uh, lists from their hometown. Um, I've also done this for the Olympics. Michael Phelps, I was looking for other Olympians. Uh, and so I just clicked on member of, and I can find those uh, very easily. Um, so you can save yourself the time uh, of creating a list and finding other people. And this is also great for finding people who aren't sort of like big names. So you want to find all the members of a city council on Twitter, uh, or you want to find all the members of a car enthusiast club on Twitter. You can do that very easily uh, using lists. Any questions about this? Yes. I, gotta, I just want to make sure that I yes, understand. Sure. Forgive me if I'm exploding everyone else. No worries. So you, can, you can find a subject or a person, then you can go to the list, and you can sub, even if you're not subscribing to them or they're not subscribing to you, mm -hmm. you can still find the lists exactly. to which they belong. Um, you can find the list that they belong to, yes. Um, the only list that you won't be able to find are private lists that they've created or private lists that other people have created. Other than that, it's fair game. And most lists are public. Other questions? All right, so this is uh, what uh, one of the lists looks like. This is election 2012. Um, you see that Rachel Maddow is on there, Rand Paul is on there, a couple of other people are on there. So it's a, a way of just grouping together uh, people around a particular subject. Uh, tip number six, I mentioned Twitter search, uh, which has become much more powerful uh, than it used to be. You used to just be able to search uh, just tweets, and now you can search for a number of different things. Uh, you can search for people. Oh, sorry, I thought your hand was up. Um, so what I've done here is to uh, put in hashtag green, and I found that um, not only do I get tweets about um, hashtag green, but I found people up there in the corner is Dr. Oz, it's Huffington Post, it's Good Magazine. So these are people that Twitter has said are tweeting about this particular subject. Uh, so it's another way if you don't want to drill down a list to find people very quickly. Um, also, Twitter is uh, much more than text. It's images and video. So if I wanted to find uh, images or video related to green or elections or during Hurricane Sandy, I wanted to see what it looked like outside of my house. Uh, so I put in Sandy, and I could find all the uh, uh, photos that people were uploading. So um, we're finding that a lot more people are uh, uploading photos and videos so you can search them very quickly. Also, um, there's a potential for using them in your reporting, um, using your due diligence as a reporter to say, hey, you know, I saw this great photo. Would you mind if we printed it or put it online? Uh, just in the same way that you would call somebody up or email them to ask permission for something that you saw. 
Uh, Twitter search also has this cool function, uh, top versus all versus people you follow. You can, the default is top. It's going to show me the most engaged uh, tweeters, the people who have been uh, retweeted the most, uh, the people who are using particular hashtags or uh, uh, mentions. So that's another reason why it's important to use the, the uh, keywords and, sorry, the Twitter handles and hashtags because you want to show up here. When people are searching for something that's in your area, you want to already be engaged so that they can see, uh, see your tweet. This is all done by algorithm. There's no uh, human uh, in the uh, in the Twitter offices that's doing this. So it's searching your account to see, are you engaged? Are people retweeting you? Uh, so uh, this is a great way to get eyeballs. Uh, people you follow, uh, you can search uh, for just the tweets from people you follow. So maybe I wanted to see what were my friends saying around the election. I could put in election, people you follow, and find them uh, very easily. Find your question. So it's a, uh, we have a question from the internet here. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a little off topic, but sure. bear with us. Yeah. Um, question is: Are DM, direct messages mm -hmm. by public officials public record? And have you have, have um, I know Gmail has been in the news that mm -hmm. Gmails sent by the mayor are public record. Sure. And would would we as a news organization mm -hmm. need to subpoena the um, Twitter to get that, if, if, if that is in fact the case? Or? So on the Twitter side, direct messages are private. Uh, we don't uh, readily hand over information and actually we fight really hard against that because we want to make um, the Twitter experience, we don't want to be sending your inf uh, information off to the first public official who asks. Um, so it depends on the public official and what the, um, this is California, different uh, rules by different states, but you'd have to check um, with that public official's office. Um, direct, but um, inherently direct messages are private, not open to report. But so is Gmail, that's inherently That's true, private. that's true. Um, but we, um, if you try to subpoena direct messages from us, we're going to take you to court. Um, so <laughs> that's been the history of Twitter. Uh, one of our, um, one of our tenants at the company is to uh, protect and defend the user's voice, uh, and we take that very seriously. You've seen that in the Occupy protests. Um, uh, courts were trying to subpoena uh, tweets from Occupy protesters, and we fought very hard against that, just because we don't um, we don't want people's tweets to be up for grab if they're not already public. I have a follow-up question yeah, about the um, uh, all. There's a pipe that's going to the Library of Congress of all mm -hmm. tweets, not direct yes. messages, yes. of course, but public tweets. Mm -hmm. um, is that is anyone using that information? Is it is it displayed anywhere? How, how do you? Yeah. Uh, so the great thing is that you don't have to go through the Library of Congress to get all the tweets that ever existed. You can use uh, third-party tools. Um, one of my favorites is called Topsy, um, and it's t o p s y dot com. Allows you to search back through the history of Twitter all the way back to 2006. Uh, you can find um, any tweet. You can find um, the most, uh, the biggest conversational tweets. I can find the most retweeted tweets about anything, uh, the biggest talkers about anything. Uh, the basic Topsy um, is not as great. It's free. Um, and the, um, uh, the Pro Topsy is a paid product, uh, but gives you much more sort of leeway in the, uh, what you can search. But yeah, uh, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to necessarily use the Library of Congress. There's other things. Uh, there's uh, GNIP, uh, GNIP, but Topsy happens, happens to be my favorite in terms of searching tweets. All right, so uh, Twitter search also comes with some advanced operators. Um, and these, if you go to twitter.com slash search and click on advanced, you're going to get some cool things um, that are especially useful to reporters um, and editors. Uh, this is very small, and I know if you're like me, your eyesight is starting to go bad. So I pulled some of my favorites. Um, so if I wanted to just search for tweets with photos, I could put in filter colon images in the search bar and then my search term. So if I were looking for uh, just tweets about Los Angeles, I could put Los Angeles space filter colon images and I find all the tweets, uh, or sorry, all the images that people uh, were sending um, that were taken in LA. Uh, you can search for tweets from verified users. So if you're covering government officials or celebrities or athletes, Twitter is really proactive in making sure that these uh, high profile people have verified accounts. And the way you get a verified account is uh, we basically have to determine that your account is susceptible to impersonation. Basically, somebody's going to create a parody account of you. Um, and so we've um, gone through the steps of verifying a lot of people. So if you're doing something, you want to say, hey, what are you know government officials saying about 
um, the election, you can put in election filter verify and just get people who have that little blue check mark assigned to their account. Uh, you can also search for tweets from a list. Um, I've mentioned lists. Uh, you can search for tweets with links. So if you wanted to find out what are the, uh, the stories that people are sharing around a particular subject, you can do that as well. And what has to be hands down my favorite, which is search for tweets near a location. So you can put in a zip code and say, hey, I just want to find tweets that were sent uh, from this particular zip code. Um, you can put near colon the city name or the zip code. And this works worldwide. So if I want to find hashtag, or sorry, um, I want to find tweets near Israel, I can do that as well. Find them in Belarus, I can find those. Uh, find them in LA, I can put near colon 90301 and find all the uh, tweets from Inglewood. And you can combine them. So if I wanted to find all the pictures that were sent near a particular zip code, I could put uh, filter images near um, zip code and then get all of, the, um, uh, all of the images near a particular location. So you can mix and match. And again, there's a lot more if you go to twitter.com slash search and click on advance. Uh, they're there. Uh, any questions about these? Cool. Uh, tip number seven, be a TweetDeck Ninja. How many of you guys are using TweetDeck? All right, a couple of hands. Uh, so if you are a powered Twitter user, you've got lots of tweets coming in, you interact with a lot of people, uh, what you want to use is TweetDeck, which allows you to sort um, uh, your tweets by column. So you can put in any of the aforementioned searches that I've just talked about. Um, you can search by keyword. So this is my um, TweetDeck during the debates. I had a uh, search for breaking news. So any tweet that mentioned the word breaking news would come through TweetDeck. Any sort of cascade, like a waterfall, the latest one being on top. Uh, in the middle, I've got hashtag debates, so anybody mentioning that. Um, and then I've got my home timeline, the people that I'm following. You could also do a column of mentions of yourself. You can do uh, a lot with TweetDeck. So if you just want to keep tabs on Twitter, you don't want to go back to search back and forth, you can keep this open on your desktop. Um, we have both the, pro, uh, the application and the, um, the client, the, um, the web client that you can use, and you can filter tweets really easily. Yes. Yes, Hootsuite also does the same thing? Yes, Hootsuite is uh, very similar. Uh, so TweetDeck is the official uh, Twitter product that's built by Twitter, Twitter engineers. And Hootsuite is a, a certified partner. Basically, we said, this is a great partner. Check it out. Uh, but they do a lot of the same things. Yeah. Other questions about TweetDeck? Cool. Number eight, I've talked about uh, tweeting photos and video. There's actually some statistics behind that, too. Uh, tweets with media receive three to four times more engagement than just your regular tweet. So just by including a photo, including a video, um, you are increasing the likelihood that, uh, that people are going to interact with your tweet. The reason is, is social media has now become very, very visual. That's why you see the YouTubes, the Tumblrs, the, uh, the Pinterest. Uh, people are uh, looking for those quick visual snapshots of what's going on. Um, we've partnered with a number of video services uh, where if you just put in the link in your tweet, it'll automatically get embedded in the tweet. And so what happens is you get that 140 characters. Um, the Fox Sports example, David Friese's back is up against the wall. You're just going to see that in your Twitter timeline. But if you hit expand, that's when you're going to see the video. So you can watch the video right there uh, from, um, the Twitter, uh, from your Twitter feed and it counts towards whatever analytics. So if you are creating a YouTube video, it's going to count towards your um, analytics for YouTube or Vimeo or whatever uh, service that you use. And also, one of the most underutilized, I think, for journalists um, uh, tools right now is graphics. People love graphics on social media. So look for opportunities. Do screenshots. Do, you know, hey, we have this interactive. You know, do a screenshot and say, to see more, click on this link because people really want that visual uh, information and it's also very shareable. And that's why you see infographics are so popular nowadays because uh, they are that visual quick hit. Yeah, what's up, Nia? Um, if you have a graphic like a, mm -hmm. a screen capture, like you said, mm -hmm. does it have to be somewhere on the web so that you can link to it for you? Or can you attach a photo? I um, you would have to attach a photo, so basically uploading it from your desktop or somewhere on your computer. So you'd save that screenshot to your computer, um, and it would upload as a picture, and then including a separate link. So you could say, um, you could put the, what I usually recommend is to put the TwitPic first, uh, or the Twitter picture first, and then the link at the end, because the link is going to be the last thing that people see. So you want to say, OK, here's the picture, but for the full information, go to this link. But yeah, you have to uh, download it to your, uh, to your computer. 
Uh, number nine, uh, use the Discover tab. So Twitter rolled out something really cool uh, not too long ago called the Discover tab, which shows the, it's basically like a front page for your Twitter feed. Uh, what are the people in your particular circle talking about? Um, so interestingly enough, um, I was away um, in a bunch of meetings and didn't hear about the Petraeus scandal when it broke. But I went to uh, the Discover tab on my mobile and I saw, hey, all these people are tweeting about Petraeus and you know, went in and did a deep dive. Uh, because I follow a lot of journalism organizations, you'll see Demon Lab and Pointer here. Uh, but it's the stories that your Twitter uh, following are talking about and also whatever is in their circle. Uh, so when the um, replacement refs were making bad calls, I don't necessarily follow a lot of sports people, but my uh, friends follow a lot of sports people. So that showed up in my Discover tab because uh, because they were talking about it. So if you're just looking for, hey, what are people on Twitter talking about within my beat, within my uh, interests, uh, you can click on the Discover tab and get that information fairly quickly. Uh, number 10, and I said this at the beginning, I'll say it at the end, don't just listen, participate. You're not going to get the most out of Twitter, what it has to offer, if you don't interact with people, if you don't reply to people, if you don't uh, tweet what other people are saying. Um, there are many ways to use Twitter, as I said, uh, but one of the best ways is curation. Um, this is Karen Tomalty from the Washington Post. She has one of the most engaged Twitter accounts because she retweets people often. Uh, so she's a political reporter. She'll retweet other political reporters or other Washington Post staff. And there's some, um, there's some numbers behind that one as well, which is journalists with above expected follower growth send 200% more retweets compared to journalists with below expected follower growth. That means just by um, retweeting other people, you're actually increasing your engagement and you're going to get more people engaging with you. Number of reasons behind that. Uh, one is because people like knowing that you are using the Twitter platform, that they have a potential opportunity to interact with you because you are retweeting other people. Um, also, they, um, journalists function as curators, and so they know that you are presenting the best information from not only yourself, but from other journalists. And also, just the Twitter algorithm, it's going to pick up on that you are retweeting other people. Um, and so um, you're going to get uh, surfaced on search. Um, more, you're more likely to get surfaced on search than you would by not retweeting anyone at all. Also, uh, something that I found particularly interesting is that if you use the retweet button versus using the traditional RT, a lot of people sort of use RT at, you know, Marcus Lucky and the tweet and the link. Um, if you use the retweet button, if you're, um, you're going to have 50% more engagement on your account overall than you would by just using all RT. Um, and um, for the reasons that I mentioned before, but what I suggest to people is if you are going to retweet someone, um, if you're just going to do a straight quote, um, use the retweet button, but if you're going to do RT, that you should add context to it. So if I'm retweeting one of Karen's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Karen's stories, and she says, new WAPO poll, meet the new poll, I would say retweet at Kate Tomlinty, hey, did you guys see this new poll? It's actually really interesting, or something along those lines, adding some context. So um, it's also a personal preference. I'm not saying you should use one or the other, but there are some, um, there are some statistical reasons behind actually using the retweet button that it actually surf, uh, services your account better than you would with the traditional RT. Questions about that? What's Is uh, Twitter looking into possibly allowing comment with your with the with the actual button or retweet? Sure. Um, so in the mobile and tweet deck, you can currently quote the tweet, basically edit and retweet, and it'll copy that initial tweet for you, and you can add context to it. Uh, we actually deprecated it. Um, and we got such um, response from people that they missed that function uh, that we put it back in. So that's why it's not on the web um, web version uh, because we wanted to take that away from people. Uh, but they said, "Hey, we want it back." So you can do it on the mobile and on TweetDeck, but you can't do it from the uh, from the web device. Seems like one of those annoying things. That yeah, you, yeah. It requires you to copy and paste, mm -hmm. and then do some editing, adding. Sure. It's true. Um, so there was an executive decision made about that. But yeah, I'll move to those guys. Yeah. So you're saying, like a tweet deck, every tweet you tweet now or edit before we tweet, you're saying just send it out for everyone yes. else, edit or anything? So think, of, um, think about it as a way of doing like a pull quote on Twitter. Um, you're just saying that this is what this person said and attributing it back to them. But if you want to add some context, some editorial context around it, then yeah, do the editing. So you need to do it's more yes, it's more effective in the long term than using the uh, the RT. Okay. 
and it shows up just like exactly like the person exactly like the person tweeted. So um, in these examples, Mike Murphy and Rich Klein, um, those tweets show up, and then under it, um, it says, and actually in the last two days they changed it. Um, it says retweeted by Karen Tumulty at the top. So it'll show up as something you've retweeted. Uh, because um, you want to, it'll show up in people's feeds. So if they don't follow Mike Murphy, it'll say, you know, this is where this tweet has come from, and it's still attributing to you. Yes. Um, I'm curious, what is expected follower growth? So expected follower growth is everyone has a baseline of uh, followers that they get per day, um, and so if we see more followers than you were getting before, or more followers. Um, in a short time uh, period, that's ex uh, more than expected follower growth. So if all of a sudden um, I'm getting you know 20 followers a day instead of five followers a day, that's above expected follower growth, and that's just for the in individual. Everyone has their own rate of followers uh, on their Twitter account. Oh. Um, last one, bonus one: find your own voice. The um, best people on Twitter, the most engaging people, and if you follow people on Twitter, you already know this: are the people who have their own voice, who you know get a bit of their personality um, into the news, not just you know sharing headlines like a robot. They're actually you know uh, making them more colorful, just in the same way I'm talking to you guys, tweeting in the same way, uh, the same way you would tell um, a story to a friend. That's how you should tweet it. Uh, because uh, those are the accounts that people are more likely to engage with. They know you're not just a feed. That you are actually communicating a little bit about yourself. And just as a personal example, there are some people on Twitter that I've followed for years that I've never actually interacted with in person. But I meet them in person, and I already know what their personality is like because I've engaged with them on Twitter, giving big hugs because I'm like, hey, you know, you're cool, you know, whatever. Um, so think about, you know, not just sort of hiding behind your bylines. Think about the best columnists that you read. They, you can get a sense of who they are. Uh, not to uh, conflate that with opinion. Um, journalists, we should steer away from sharing um, our opinion on Twitter, uh, just because that's you know how journal journalism has worked for a very long time. We don't want people to uh, our opinion of stories to color um, our reporting or how people see us as reporters. But there's a difference between you know sharing um, sharing my voice. Uh, on a story versus sharing my opinion on the story, and think about how to um, how to separate the two. So, additional resources, we've got some good stuff for you guys. Um, specifically, uh, resources for journalists. How do you engage? What are examples of how other newsrooms have engaged? Uh, how do you create good hashtags? What are good hashtags? It's Bitly slash Twitter for News. Uh, Twitter for News is all capitalized. And also, I'd encourage you to follow the Twitter for News um, account. Uh, we've gotten great resources, constantly finding good tips on there, um, other ways that journalists have used it. And if you're using Twitter um, and you've done like a great hashtag or a great conversation, or you've done something really unique, uh, you know, shoot us an email or shoot us a tweet. We'd love to retweet it. We've got about 300,000 followers on there, and most of them are not uh, journalists. They're people who are interested in news. Um, so you know, it's a great way to sort of uh, promote whatever Twitter uh, centric idea or um, account that you may have. Um, my email isn't on here, but I'll give it to you. It's mlucky, M-L-U-C-K-I-E, at twitter.com. Uh, if you have questions about anything, standing by, um, be able to help you. Uh, for more technical questions about API, uh, Twitter cards, um, <clears throat> TweetDeck, and things like that, uh, my colleague Erica Anderson is the person that I'll forward you to. She works on technical and site integration specifically for journalists. Um, so there you go. I'll be happy. To, oh, and I won't move right now, but I have, before you leave, I have some gifts uh, for you guys um, to take away. Uh, physical gifts, not just <laughs> my presence. <laughs> um, so I'd be happy to take any questions about anything that I have. Yes? With uh, using tweet tech for Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you have a list for breaking. Mm -hmm. Do you also uh, more than always down to location, let's say within 10, 20 miles on something that you have? Absolutely. Um, so what you do is in the, let me see if I can go back here. So what you would do is uh, put your search term. Then that lists um, your username slash whatever the name is, and also include the uh, location filter. So you can use as many of these as you want uh, within a single search. And that would be a way to drill down either your breaking news list or the keyword breaking news uh, just by location. 
And you can put that, you can incorporate that in your into tweet TweetDeck, deck, yes. Uh, so when you create a new column in TweetDeck, um, and it asks you for the search term, that's what you're going to put in. Yes? I'm just curious, what was the thinking behind taking away the ability to direct message people that don't, that don't follow you? That, that, was, that was a sad day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually don't have the answer for that. Um, I can find out. That preceded me coming on uh, to Twitter. Uh, so I can find out the answer for you. Any chance we can change that back? I doubt that that's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of things that we're working on in direct messages. I can tell you it's not one of the uh, focus areas for right now. Yeah. yeah. The, the location, is that based on the information that the users give? It? <coughs> it's not GPS or anything? Yeah, so I forgot to mention that. So the location is based on two things. One, if you uh, when you sign up for Twitter, you, uh, you get a little notice that says, would you like to geotag your tweets? Basically, would you like to assign a location to them? So we know that if you, you know, if I'm tweeting from LA or tweeting from New York, you know, there's a difference uh, that Twitter knows where I'm physically tweeting from because I've uh, given that location. We also um, do by keyword or by um, algorithm. Um, so if I am tweeting, hey, I'm at, um, you know, the Hollywood sign, the Twitter algorithm knows that I'm likely in LA. And so you're seeing like a 60 to 70 percent accuracy uh, with something like that. Um, and so those tweets will filter in, and a couple oddball tweets will get in there. Uh, but by searching by what you're tweeting about, we can figure out where you are. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, if you include a photo that has um, location information in the metadata of the photo, then we know where that uh, photo was taken, and we know where the tweet was taken. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. Another one from uh, Ben internet. Welch from the internet. Um, he asks, if a Twitter user posts a newsworthy photo, is it ethical for us to republish it? Mm -hmm. What should we do? Um, so in that case, it depends on where it's going. Um, if it's going online, what I encourage you to do is to use embedded tweets. Um, so now if you go to any, um, any tweet, you'll get a link at the bottom of it that says embed this tweet. You can copy that short code and you can paste it into your uh, site or to your article or to your blog post. Uh, the advantage of that is, is that people can retweet, they can reply, they can favor it all from that particular tweet. So it has an advantage over doing a screenshot. Um, if you're looking to take it out of the Twitter context, um, I would contact that Twitter user. Just like you wouldn't you know, take a photographer's uh, photos, uh, you need to ask uh, that Twitter user uh, for permission. And just because they don't respond to you doesn't necessarily mean that they've given their OK. So by using it in the Twitter context, you're Yes, you're, you're absolving yourself from um, whatever laws. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to say what those are. Uh, but yes, uh, keeping it in Twitter contents. Uh, because the person you. uploaded it on Twitter exactly. agreed to exactly. the terms. Of exactly, and agree to their uh, tweets being shareable. I will say that your tweets are your own. Uh, Twitter doesn't own your content. It doesn't own your tweets. Um, so that's why the, uh, the tweets and the photos belong to that particular user. I'll try to just answer the question. So if we upload our own photos, yes. they still belong to us. They so still belong to you. Exactly. Okay. Yes, they're yours. Cool. Other questions? Is I mean, you in the past worked, Twitter's worked with Storify. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Is that still, are they still a, uh, yes. a, a, a partner? Uh, yeah, they're still a partner. Um, we're still working with them. Um, feel free uh, to use Storify if you, um, Storify is a tool for, uh, embedding uh, multiple social media sources into a blog post uh, has really sort of revolutionized how um, uh, social media has been used for journalism, being able to embed them just as you would. Uh, it's sort of like a first party source. Here's what um, social media is saying. So yeah, check out Storify. And we also have, um, if you're looking for just Twitter messages, we have something called embedded timelines now. So you can embed a timeline with tweets either from a particular user or from a particular list. Uh, you can also uh, create a uh, Twitter timeline of just favorites. So if you wanted to curate tweets, uh, sort of in the same way that you did with Sorify, uh, you can just favorite a couple of tweets. We've seen news organizations create dummy accounts specifically uh, for this uh, purpose. And you can create a timeline that um, is live um, and can live on your site or in your blog post. Cool. All right, so as I mentioned, I've got gifts. Um, I've got. These custom made only for you guys. I tweet LA. Uh, so uh, I'm going to come around and uh, give this to you. And again, if you guys have questions or anything, I am standing by. Yeah, no problem. 
Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. All right, for the home viewers, we're going to sign off now. Thanks for joining us. Adios.